Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today I will talk about drones and their possible attack vectors, and hopefully it will be a nice fly. So before I start, um, I want to thank you all the people, especially some of my friends that helped me with this research, and uh, especially one guy that followed me in various field trips in order to test all the attack vectors that uh, I will show you later. Um, the guy preferred to be anonymous, so I will thank him without a, with a, an empty slide, but he knows. So um, let me introduce myself for a moment. I'm Paolo Stagno, and uh, I'm better known um, on the internet as a VoidSec. And since the beginning of my career, uh, I've mainly dealt with uh, penetration tests and red team. While now that I'm DoyenSec, I'm moving towards um, the research of new vulnerabilities and uh, uh, application security. So here you can find some details if you want to reach me or uh, um, if you would like to ask me uh, further questions. So I'm sorry. I know that some of you were hoping about this, but uh, I will not speak about it. While I mainly divided my research into three main blocks, um, the first one uh, where I will speak about um, uh, vulnerability research and uh, the main attack vectors. After that, we will have a bit of reverse engineering, uh, speaking about the SDK. And the last part, uh, there is uh, um, drone forensics. So since the first introduction in the consumer market, um, we've seen drones used by different sectors. Uh, for example, the law enforcement, where drones were used for um, border control or um, patrolling. After that, another project that is a beautiful pro project where uh, drones were used as a portable uh, defibrillators. And also, the drones were also used in uh, um, uh, to check uh, some places that are not easily reachable by a man. So you can think about uh, large infrastructure, bridges, uh, and stuff. And unfortunately, in 2017, uh, some modified version of drone were also used um, in Syria and Iraq uh, to drop projectile explosive um, uh, on the battleground. And obviously, drones were also used by uh, all the creative mind for aerial uh, photos and videos. And personally, I've used drone uh, during red team engagement uh, in order to map uh, physical access for big plants or uh, uh, drones with, uh, equipped with a pineapple in order to map a Wi-Fi uh, hotspot around the place. And in this panorama, a Chinese company called uh, DJI quickly gained the fame and reputation as the most stable area platform for uh, video filming and shooting. And um, that's what you see in the slide is the uh, DJI Phantom 3. And uh, on this product, uh, I based all my research and this talk. So as you can see from the slide, um, there is the main body of the drone, and it's a ground controller and some various equipment. As I said before, um, these are some of the key points of, the vec uh, of this version. Uh, so um, the drone weighs uh, 1.2 kilograms. Um, it's 800 grams of, uh, uh, for the drone, uh, 400 grams for, for the battery. And uh, the drone is also easy to fly with another 400 gram of payload, so you can modify it with, for example, adding a pineapple or other stuff. And um, usually it has 20, 25 minutes of uh, autonomy. It's really depending on the weather condition, especially for the wind. And um, its maximum speed is uh, 16 meter per second or 57 kilometer per hour. And um, yeah, I was mentioning it earlier. It is uh, an excellent uh, platform for the stability of its shoots. OK, I'm joking. This is the video feedback of uh, a race drone. Um, while, yeah, this is the, vi the real video footage um, of a drone. Um, I was flying near the sea, so there is uh, uh, a little of wind. But as you can see, um, the video is still very stable. OK, and these are some photos in different uh, um, weather condition, wind condition, and the light condition. Um, the left corner and the right corner are from my hometown in Turin. 
Italy. So I'm just proud of it. <laughs> okay, now I will introduce you um, the drone architecture in its components. So the drone, uh, the main aircraft, has some, uh, a lot of technological components like uh, the flight controller, the radio modules, um, some other GPS module or sensor like compass and uh, gyroscope. And also there is another part that is the ground controller. This is basically only a radio module for uh, communicating commands to the drone. And um, the last block is the application that is optional that you can use on mobile phone. And um, um, it has some kind of uh, uh, flight assisted navigation for, for example, drone takeoff, return to home, and uh, waypoint path fly. And that's pretty much uh, the architecture of this model. So the first things that I did was trying to understand uh, its network schema. Uh, basically, the ground controller is acting as an um, access point, a Wi-Fi access point for the drone and the camera. And drone and camera are two different systems. So um, uh, they probably separate the drone uh, from the camera in order to don't have the mm, video feedback interfere with uh, um, the flight controller. And um, uh, as I said before, uh, there is the optional usage of uh, a mobile phone where you can retrieve the video, uh, the video feedback uh, on screen so you can see what the drone is, uh, is seeing. And this is the list of the exposed services uh, within the network that I showed you before. So basically, I'm having a flying FTP server, and um, all the interesting services like uh, SSH and Telnet are filtered out. So um, uh, FTP is always reachable because you have to uh, download the media uh, files from the drone. And the port uh, uh, 5678, it's also used by the, uh, the mobile application, the Android iOS mobile application. While this is the last version of the firmware, and this is the, the, um, the map scan of the network, so they um, filtered out a lot of uh, unnecessary services, and they only left the core one. And specifically, they left the um, FTP, because it's also used for uh, uploading the new firmware on the drone and retrieve the flight logs and uh, the port used by the application. And this hardening was due to contrast uh, an illegal mod market that basically allow people to um, change, for example, the maximum altitude of the drone or um, remove some limitation like the no-fly zone. And regarding the communication between uh, the aircraft and the controller, um, there is a Wi-Fi connection that is uh, established by the ground controller to the drone, and it will transport uh, flight data and video stream uh, to the phone. So the drone, um, this model, uh, will not use the Lightbridge protocol, that is uh, uh, a proprietary DJI protocol for uh, long distance stream, and it has some kind of uh, um, greater stability for, uh, for long ranges, and it also allows uh, full HD streaming and some master and slave system. Uh, and the Lightbridge uh, protocol is used on uh, a more expensive and professional drone uh, of DJI. Uh, while on this one, um, the standard is, uh, of the Wi-Fi is the WPA2, and um, the default SSID is derived from the MAC address, from the remote controller, uh, and is uh, following the following format. So it's phantom3 underscore uh, the last six digit of the MAC address. And the default password is the evergreen strong password, 1234, 1234. So if you don't change it, anyone can connect to your network and exploit some other functionality of the drone. And obviously, drones are not exempt for, uh, from most uh, classic Wi-Fi attacks. So we have some predefined behavior in the case of the authentication attack. And the authentication attack will force the disconnection of the phone or controller um, from the drone. 
So in the event of the, um, a phone that is disconnected from uh, the ground controller, uh, nothing happened. The ground controller still hold the priority, and it will be able to continue to drive the drone. While if we make an authentication attack to disconnect the controller from the drone, uh, well, that will trigger the automatic um, return to home functionality. So return to home uh, consists in um, bringing, the, bringing the drone to a predetermined um, altitude, that is the default 30 meter from the ground, and after that the drone will fly straight line uh, on the last GPS point that um, was set as a home point. So um, this functionality cannot be used without the GPS. And um, what happens if we try to uh, add a new device into the existing network? Well, the aircraft uh, maintain a queue of uh, devices, uh, and the queue leaves the priority to the first connected phone. So uh, if we disconnect the first connected phone, the second one can now connect and uh, use the functionality of the application. And if we try to use mobile phone and ground controller uh, at the same time, uh, the ground controller still has the priority, uh, but uh, using all of them at the same time will make all the system a lot less manageable. So it will be hard to fly if uh, you are poking around with the mobile phone. And uh, again, uh, Wi-Fi attack is the common one. Uh, the network settings cannot be downgraded to WAP, and there is no support for, for the WPS. Uh, while the WPA um, 2 is uh, vulnerable to the standard uh, four-way end shade attack, so we can recover the um, pressured key. And also, uh, we will see it later, but since the drone system is based on uh, open WRT, and DJI never released a patch uh, after the crack advisory, it is also vulnerable to crack. And this is one of the examples. So I was using Fluxion and uh, a good dictionary, and it was just a matter of some time to recover the pressured key that you can see. OK, so uh, basically, my goal was to obtain uh, at least a shell, possibly a root shell, on the main aircraft. And um, at this point, I had some uh, good services like SSH and Telnet, but they were filtered. So, and also, I don't have the credential for these services. And so the first things that uh, come to my mind was to try to explore um, the application that DJI provide uh, for the video feedback as some other assisted control. So here's a small um, digression. Uh, in Phantom 3 model and later, um, DJI provides a geofencing system or an inbuilt no-fly zone list. And the no-fly zone are, as shown by the image, some virtual fences with specific diameter, which the drone cannot fly, fly in. So this makes possible to exclude some location, like the airports or military bases, from drone flight. Uh, specifically, DJI makes also available to pilots uh, a map where you can see, country by country, the list of no-fly zones uh, in, in this area. And there are three different types, uh, actually four different types of no-fly zone. Uh, but I will only mention three of them because the fourth is basically just a, a variation of one of them. So um, there is the warning zone, that are uh, zone in green, and where user will be just prompt with a warning message. And so, for example, protected world, fight, um, world life sorry, area will have the uh, green marker, but you will just get a warning message and you will be able to fly. After that, we will have a yellow zone or authorization zone. Authorization zone um, will require a verified DJI pilot account and internet connection uh, in order to unlock this, uh, this area. Um, so you, have, you need to have um, the account on DJI and also internet connection. You will be able to unlock the area and will be able to fly. And the last one is the red one, the restricted zone, and um, our zone where the drone cannot fly in. So if you try to uh, fly the drone inside a no-fly zone, that is the restricted one, uh, you won't be able to fly. But the main problem is that uh, no-fly zone 
is using GPS. So if you don't have GPS coverage, the no-fly zone list uh, is useless. And also, um, the drone cannot be tricked, while uh, if you have GPS fix and try to put the drone into the attitude mode, that basically will uh, exclude the GPS system, um, but the drone still has the fix, uh, it will refuse to fly inside a no-flight zone. And um, this is basically one of the systems that DJI is using to update no-flight zone that are inbuilt in the firmware. So while they are upgrading your um, DJI application on mobile phone, they, I, they are also pushing some new updates for no-flight zone. And this is one of the examples. So uh, as you can see from the slide, in uh, blue, you can see the information about uh, the position and the radius of the no-flight zone, while in red, you can see the type of no-flight zone. Um, in this case, it's a stadium, so no uh, the flight is not permitted. And um, uh, we can see uh, the level, different level mean uh, different kind of no-flight zone. While in violet, you can see um, the expiration time uh, or when uh, a no-flight zone was first introduced uh, into the no-flight zone list. And lastly, in green, you can see the name of the no-flight zone. As I, can say, um, as I said before, it's a stadium, the Juventus Stadium in my city, so the flight is not permitted. Uh, and the main problem with uh, these updates is that uh, the application resources uh, are not signed. So you can just edit the, uh, the resources, you can just edit this, uh, this JSON file, and you can invalidate the uh, introduction of this new no-flight zone list. And continuing diving inside the application, I was also able to found um, this configuration file that is holding the password for the aircraft. And you know, uh, the password is Big China, is a Chinese product. And um, they are also trying to improve because uh, uh, in previous models, uh, they were using only digits. So they are slowly trying to improve. So perfect, now I have the root password. Yeah, the problem is that mm, the services are still filtered, and FTP service is basically chi-rooted, so I cannot uh, uh, traverse the file system. Um, so I was trying to think to other attacks that I, will, uh, I can bring against the drone. So I tried some uh, firmware replacement, but there is some kind of uh, checksum that prevent me to replace the firmware. And um, since I'm lazy and doing the firmware analysis uh, would uh, mm, require a lot of time, I prefer to search for um, some simple keywords and grab for them. And I was able to extract some ashes of the users, which I cracked. So now I'm full of password and uh, username, but I'm still not able to use in this, this, this um, combination because the, the services are, are filtered. So again, um, I also thought that some of the countermeasures uh, can be uh, introduced uh, in later updates. So even if it's not documented, I found out that if you press this three small line in the application, uh, basically a new menu will pop out and you can downgrade the firmware. So I downgraded the firmware from the last version to a precedent one. And um, when I downgraded the, the firmware, I was able to uh, traverse the file system using the FTP. So the FTP was not um, chi-rooted anymore, and um, I basically downloaded the entire file system and start uh, its analysis. And from the file system, I recovered the fact that uh, DJI is using a fork of OpenWRT, uh, uh, the version 1407, and it's called the Barrier Breaker, and it's full also of uh, custom DJI binary. So I also found uh, these scripts, and these scripts um, are running at boot time, and they are holding some information about uh, the network connection and network settings. Uh, so adding the following command, the telnet minus l and bin hash and so on, I was able to re reactivate the telnet uh, service, and I was able to connect. So I was finally root, 
and that was great, but uh, I didn't finish yet because uh, uh, basically I left out uh, one of the um, third element of the DJI package. So until now, I didn't have considered um, the SDK as an attack vector. And the sad story is that the first time that I tried to compile the SDK, uh, I received back something like 11,000 error messages. But at the end, with some, you know, armor technique, I was made to make it work. And um, the main idea of uh, the SDK is that um, DJI provide, provide um, SDK, and you can build your custom application of top, on top of the SDK. So the idea of SDK as an attack vector was um, isolate some specific instruction uh, sent to the drone while uh, sniffing, you know, the traffic. And um, I would like to implement uh, a custom application that could send some specific payloads to the drone. Uh, like, for example, the um, disconnecting from the actual Wi-Fi and connecting to another network in order to get uh, you know, a full drone takeover. But also, again, SDK has a, a, an unlock mechanism. So it's required to have a DJI account and request an API token from the server. And fortunately, in the version that is not the lastest, uh, was one of the precedent one, uh, it was enough to um, patch the Java bytecode, uh, adding basically the SDK level uh, variable to two. That, that means um, that we perform the API token request and the server accept our request and this SDK is now unlocked. So without you having a, a real SDK account, um, I was able to use it. And this is the communication flow between uh, application and drone. I have filtered out uh, all the UDP traffic because UDP traffic is used for uh, video feedback between application and, and drone. And DJI use a custom TCP-based protocol for flight control. So I started some uh, reverse engineering of the protocol, but fortunately, um, this protocol is, is also very similar to the one that is used by uh, previous model of Phantom series. So some of the fields were already um, been identified by the community. And this is the structure of the uh, DJI packet. We have an either of four bytes and a payload that is of variable length. And the either is formed for uh, four bytes. The first byte is a, a magical number, magical protocol number, so it's always the same. And after that, we have uh, the packet length, so we have uh, either plus payloads. And the third byte um, is uh, uh, the version that we are using of uh, the SDK. And the last byte of the either is a custom uh, DJI checksum that I was able to derive from uh, some R coded values that are um, present into the SDK. And after that, we have the payload structure. So we have the first byte that is telling us uh, the source of the packet, in this case, the application that is speaking with uh, the remote controller. After that, we have a sequence number that is an incremental number of the packets and uh, a flag that, honestly, I don't know for which is being used. Uh, it's changing depending on the packets, but I wasn't able to figure it out. And after that, we have the command. In this case, it's set remote controller, I think. And another ID that is, again, incremental. And after that, we have some optional uh, bytes that are holding the real meaning of the packet. So if in, in this case we are um, setting something uh, uh, on the remote controller, the optional byte will, will, uh, will hold the settings for, for, um, for the value that we are um, editing. OK, last attack vector for the drone, um, GPS. And GPS was the main attack vector and the attack vector on which I focus mostly. Uh, and mainly because uh, it is completely remote and uh, um, it doesn't have the um, prerequisite of having um, one of uh, attacker device inside the network of the drone. So, and it's also the most common way to eject a civil drone since uh, um, civil GPS signal uh, is not encrypted. 
And uh, speaking about the GPS attack, uh, the most common way is uh, to perform the replay attack. So we are um, replying uh, our previously recorded um, signal. And uh, as a setup, I used the, as a software the GPS SDR sim. That is a nice software. Uh, it can um, generate some GPS signal. And as an hardware, I choose the AKRF one. Um, it's a great piece of hardware, and it's also kind of cheap if we compare to other devices because it's 300 euro. But there are uh, other SDR that are uh, a lot more expensive. So. Uh, the main problem with AKRF is that uh, its internal clock is not precise enough uh, for GPS replying. So um, I needed to buy um, an external clock that is a really small uh, electronic component uh, um, that you basically had to put uh, on top of the AKRF in order to, to get a precise clock for GPS attack. The uh, problem with uh, this external clock is that um, you need to have it shipped from China, so it would take one month you know, before it arrived. And um, yeah, uh, before we will able to generate our uh, GPS signal, uh, we need to gather some uh, basic data that are called uh, ephemeris data. And these data um, are containing information about the um, current and future location of a satellite. And ephemeris data can be gathered from a uh, NASA website. They can be freely uh, assessed. And um, usually, you have to download a new ephemeris data every 24 hours, um, even if ephemeris data are considered good enough uh, until 30 days. Um, the first time that I tried to perform GPS attack, uh, I was using a really old uh, ephemeris data, and I wasn't able to spoof GPS signals. So I would recommend, if you have to try, to download the last uh, ephemeris data, because I lost the entire morning trying to understand why I was, it wasn't working. So, um, and this is the result of a GPS spoofing attack. Uh, the device now thinks that I'm in Turkey, while, of course, I'm not. Another thing that I would like to point out, um, the time information um, is one uh, that is contained inside the spoofed signal, so we can spoof space and time. Um, keep that in mind because we will need it later. So the drone was in Italy, but I was spoofing um, the location of the White House, that is uh, surprisingly an offline zone. So if I try to fly, yeah, I got this error message. Um, and funny things, DJI thinks that the no-fly zone of uh, um, White House is because it's uh, a nuclear power plant. So maybe they know something that we don't. And um, if we spoof no-fly zone um, where there isn't, the drone cannot take off. But uh, if the drone is inside a no-fly zone and we spoof a fake position, so another uh, zone that is not an off -light zone, the drone will be unlocked and will be able to fly. So we can counter an off -light zone with GPS spoofing, or we can counter drone uh, setting up uh, uh, on-demand an off -light zone. And yeah, this is what happens if the drone is flying and uh, we force, um, we fake an off -light zone, the drone is forced to land. Um, yeah, I would like to bring a uh, you know, live demo, but uh, person and flying drone in the same area is not, uh, <laughs> is not the best thing, so that's why I'm using the video. And um, keep also in mind that uh, with my hardware setup or software setup, both of them, um, this attack would take something like 10 to 15 minutes probably using some better hardware equipment or some uh, optimized software uh, will be easier to perform this attack. And this is the schema that can be used uh, with you know, hard, the right hardware equipment to perform the complete takeover. So the real drone is on the green marker. And um, at that point, uh, two different attacks um, are performed uh, against the drone. The first one will be a authentication attack for um, the main controller. So it will trigger the return to home functionality. 
And at the same time, we will also perform GPS spoofing attack. So now drone thinks to be on the red marker, and it will try to fly home, uh, while in reality, it will fly on the opposite direction uh, in another location. So we can basically capture or shut down the drone. And um, this is basically the concept uh, behind GPS spoofing attack. But we have to combine two different attacks, the, the authentication attack and GPS spoofing. So how we can notice GPS attack? Um, as far as I was able to understand, with my setup, uh, we can basically validate GPS packet subframe. Uh, real GPS packets, as, uh, as you can see from the image, uh, subframe set with uh, real data, while with my setup, the subframe is all set to zero. So if from the device we can check this, uh, uh, this subframe, we can discard all the GPS packets that has uh, all zero subframe. And another thing, we can try to validate the time that we are getting from the GPS signal uh, with the time that we have set on device. So if the two times are uh, too much different, uh, we should refuse, for example, a GPS signal that we are receiving. And the last and third option that we have is to check uh, the time spent traveling between two different GPS positions. So if we are in Italy and after one second the new GPS position uh, is China, we should refuse the GPS signal that we are receiving because it's impossible. OK, third and pretty much last block, um, DJI drone forensics. So uh, with the increasing number of uh, drone incidents, I thought that uh, it can be interesting to understand and, uh, uh, and know where we can retrieve uh, um, data from uh, a specific model. And uh, in this case, data are in three main locations. Um, the camera that is mounted on the gimbal from which we can retrieve uh, media files. And, um, the TXT file that are present on mobile phone that is uh, uh, holding the mobile application of DJI, and third and last location uh, are um, .dat file that, is, that are present in a memory that is, again, is not documented, but if you disassemble the drone, uh, you will be able to discover this memory. And this memory is um, present on the motherboard of the drone and is the real um, aircraft black box or a flight recorder. So we have these uh, three main locations. Speaking about the that file present on the black box, uh, they, again, um, they are proprietary DJI file. And the structure of the file, um, as you can see from the image, is really resemble um, the packet structure for uh, SDK. So again, we have the first byte that is a magic number, always um, 55 hexadecimal value. And after that, we have again, uh, who's speaking, the sensor, and uh, again, uh, other indication. Um, basically, I didn't spend a lot of time in trying to understand this, uh, that file, because there is uh, an already aviable tool that is called uh, DROP, um, Drone Open Source Parser, um, which we, you will be able to find the reference in the slides. And uh, it will be able to uh, parse this dead file and uh, um, retrieve a more easily readable format uh, for you. So um, I then spent some uh, time uh, for other stuff. For example, um, what happens if the uh, data on the black box, uh, I mean, what happens if the black box uh, is, uh, is full of data? So all this data is overwritten, but uh, not only um, by deleting file pointers. Um, basically, they um, zeroed out the space of this older file, and that will reduce the chance of forensic recovery. And, uh, and it's also possible, and I was a bit astonished and upset when I discovered it, uh, it's also possible to fly the drone without this, uh, uh, this memory, without the black box. So um, this uh, 
can be used as a, an anti-forensic technique because if we uh, remove the, the main memory, the last um, location is the mobile phone that is optional, uh, so we are not required to use mobile phone. And um, um, uh, um, files on the gimbal and files on the camera are only for uh, media files, so they are not so useful. So these are all the data that uh, we can extract from both that file and txt file. Um, but especially I'm focusing on uh, that file because um, they are on the main aircraft body. So what can we do if we uh, aggregate all this information? Well, for example, we can show um, the drone fly path and we can also show some uh, statistics related to maximum altitude and uh, speed, distance, and so on. And we can also reconstruct the entire sensor signal um, through the fly path. So in this specific example, I'm showing you the event of uh, a signal lost, but uh, we, yeah, we can uh, recover a list of all the uh, occurred events in a, a given time frame. And uh, for every event, so we can also recover the altitude of the drone and the distance from the on point. So if we intersect uh, all data, basically gimbal data, flight data, and the events in which uh, photos or video are taken, we can also reconstruct uh, um, this kind of map that can show us um, what the operator was able to see and photograph. So we can be better than CSA. And um, now, uh, if the dead file remains stored only on the memory of the drone and they are not, be sh and they are not shared, um, different approach is for TXT file. TXT file on mobile phone uh, are used to feed the statistic of DJI pilot account. So they are uh, uploaded entirely on, um, on DJI server. And they will use to uh, um, show a small recap or, of your flight online. And uh, with all this uh, data shared to Chinese servers, uh, it's not um, hard to understand why US Army uh, banned DJI pro products uh, in the summer 2017. Also, this is are all the permissions that you have to share with basically DJI in order, um, uh, for the GPS location only, in order to have all the uh, functionality. Because if you are not, if you're not allowed uh, all these uh, uh, different uh, uh, GPS um, settings, basically you will lose uh, the access uh, to some functionality. So you can only use some, some really base uh, flight from, from, for your drone. Okay, some minor things that uh, uh, I have not previously, previously said. Um, the, the video feedback on the drone has no type of checksum, so we can potentially uh, spoof the video feedback and show any type of uh, image uh, on the operator screen. Another thing, um, the drone is really sensitive to electromagnetic fields and um, it has a compass system that requires um, calibration before the first flight. And um, I can tell you from experience that um, if you try to, um, for example, turn on the drone next to a big uh, mass of metal, uh, the compass uh, will go crazy and it will require um, calibration. Okay, since I think I still have two minutes. Uh, these are some of the drone countermeasures that have been created to defend uh, against drone. And um, even if these, uh, these countermeasures uh, are not effective in case of uh, a huge swarms of drones or very, very tiny and miniaturized uh, drone. So this is of an example of drone netting. is a drone that is shooting a net to neutralize another drone. And after that, they started to training eagles in order to take down drones. But yeah, confetti gun can also be effective. Or yeah, jet ski. 
And, and now you can imagine the pain of drone operators since the drone in the image is costing like 4,000 euro. And this is what happened in reality. They shoot down drone with $3 million miss. OK, so um, yeah, further works. Uh, things that I left out. Um, so I can maybe try to uh, reverse engineering and decompile all the custom binary uh, that are present on uh, this modified version of OpenWRT in order to find some you know, cool exploit and maybe uh, something that can be exploited uh, inside the same network of the drone. Or maybe I can play with something that is more complex next time. So maybe fourth model of DJI or the upcoming new ones. OK, some reference and useful links that you will be able to find in the slides. And with this, I end my talk. So if there are any questions. Is there any way that a DOS attack can be used for the drones? Sorry? You were mentioning the network protocols. Yep. So is there a way that a DOS attack can be used, like denial of service for the drones? Does it make any effect on this? Uh, well, honestly, I didn't try the denial of service attack on the drone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can be uh, something that can be performed. Uh, but again, you need to have, to, to, to have a device inside the network of the drone. So. It's not that easy unless they, they left the default password on the drone. Yeah, like because if we consider like uh, a defense mechanism against the drones, so instead of using like that 300 million mm -hmm. yeah. equipment, we, maybe we can have some protocol fuzzer or a denial of service machine, which would be quite easier and it would not be any mechanical thing. No, it's yeah. just a radio. Yeah, but you still need to connect this device to the network. But OK, OK. So Thank you. No problem. Anybody? Anybody else? No. In that case, thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you.